Hi, this is Maggie from Design Code Debug Repeat. Welcome to the channel. This video and the others in the Chapter 3 Problem Solving with Python playlist are an introduction to the concepts you will need to write programs with branching, or if statements. This video accompanies Problem Solving with Python Chapter 3, but it's okay if you don't have the book. The videos stand alone as instruction on these topics. We're beginning in this video with branching flow of control, if statements, and relational operators. Let's dive in. I have the idle console open here, and I urge you to open up the idle console and program along with me. Do that and experiment with the program as we go. That's the best way to learn. I'm going to begin by creating an editing window. We can practice a lot of concepts in the console, but usually you will be writing Python scripts, not experimenting in the console. So I will choose File, New File to get an editing window. I'm going to write a very short program here so we can talk about the sequential and branching flow of control. I'll begin with a doc string at the top, three quotes, obtain the user's favorite flavor of ice cream and print a special message if it's coffee. And then three more quotes. And our program will first ask the user for their favorite flavor of ice cream. So I'll put a comment, annotate variables, and I'll annotate favorite flavor colon str or string. Remember, that's what programmers call text. And remember, we annotate variables with a colon, and this is just documentation telling other programmers the data type of the variable. It does not define the variable. To define it, we'll ask the user their favorite flavor of ice cream in an input statement and assign the result to the variable using an assignment statement. So I'll write a comment, ask the user their favorite flavor, and then I'll write favorite flavor equals input. What is your favorite ice cream flavor? Remember that input returns a string, so I don't need to cast that to another type. And I'm going to save that as ice cream and run it. So I'll save it. And now I'll press F5. And in the console, I see the prompt, what is your favorite ice cream flavor? And it blinks. It's waiting for me, the user, to type something. Remember, that's what the input statement does. I'll type chocolate and press enter. And now the program's done running. That's all it does. We can tell it's done running because we're back to idle's prompt. Okay, now suppose I want to print a special message but only if the user entered coffee as their favorite ice cream flavor. That means that I want to write some code that will execute sometimes when the program runs, when the user types coffee, or when the variable favorite flavor has the string coffee assigned to it. But if the user types something else, like chocolate, then the program isn't going to do anything special. That is called conditional or branching flow of control. You can think of it as a branch on a tree sort of. The trunk is where the program begins, and then if certain conditions are met, the program goes down a branch. Maybe under other conditions, it goes down a different branch. And which branch executes won't be known until the program is running at runtime. The default flow of control is sequential. Programs always start with sequential flow of control, top to bottom in the script or program file. But there are Python commands that can change the flow of control. The flow of control is only going to change if we write one of those commands. The one we're going to learn in this video is if. We write after favorite flavor has a value, if favorite flavor equals equals coffee in quotes, and then a colon. And when I press enter, notice the cursor is on the next line, but it's indented four spaces. And notice that if turned orange, which is the color idle uses for Python keywords. I know I typed it correctly if it turns orange. Notice it's lowercase i, lowercase f. And I'm going to type now my special message, print. You must be from Rhode Island. I didn't know growing up around here that coffee milk and coffee ice cream wasn't a standard flavor in other parts of the country. It might be more common now. I don't know. Okay, so let me put a comment over the if statement. Print a special message if the user's favorite ice cream flavor is coffee. 
and let's run the program. I'm going to enter chocolate again at the prompt and it does nothing just like before, but let me run it again. And this time I'll enter coffee. And notice that now it prints the message. So let's talk about what happened. I ran the program. Execution began sequentially. There were some comments and variable annotations, which don't do anything at runtime. And then there was an input statement and the user entered a value. That value was assigned to the variable favorite flavor. The program then executed the next line, which is if favorite flavor equals equals coffee. You can probably guess what that did. It checked or tested the condition favorite flavor equals equals coffee. That expression checks to see if the value assigned to favorite flavor is equal to the string coffee. And if it is, then the indented code executes. So when I typed chocolate, the test favorite flavor equals equals coffee evaluated to false because favorite flavor was chocolate and chocolate does not equal coffee. And so the indented or conditional code was skipped. But when I typed coffee, then the value assigned to favorite flavor was equal to coffee, the test was true, and the indented code executed. Whether the condition was true or false, once the conditional code had either been skipped or had executed, Python would continue executing the code sequentially after the if statement. The if statement is both the condition and the indented code. So where previously each line of code we saw was one statement, now we have a block statement, a statement that can extend over many lines of code. Now you can write whatever you want inside a conditional block, whatever makes sense for your program. So we could put more print statements, for example, after the first one. We could also write, do you know the big blue bug? Or have you been to Newport? Or whatever we like. We could have more input statements, even more if statements inside the if block. We'll go into detail on that in another video. But with the two statements I have here, they're both indented. So those both execute if the condition is true and they're both skipped if it's false. So the syntax for an if statement is the keyword if, remember lowercase if and it should turn orange, followed by a condition and we'll talk about that more in a moment. A condition is also called a test because we're testing the value in one or more variables. And then a colon. After the colon, any indented lines are the body of the if statement and will execute only if the condition is true. Let's talk about true and false. I've been throwing those words around without addressing them. True and false are literals for a new data type called a Boolean. I think that intuitively this probably makes sense. If favorite flavor equals equals coffee, we can see that's going to be either a yes or a no, or a true or a false. In programming, we have expressions that evaluate to a Boolean type, true or false. This is what we refer to as logic, and you can see that logic can be used to determine whether some code will execute or not. We use logic to test the state of the program, the values in variables, and then we can use that information to decide what code to execute. Let's look at another example that will prevent an error in the program. Let's get two numbers from the user and divide them. So I'll create a new script. And at the top, I'll write the doc string, demonstrate avoiding divide by zero. And then I'll annotate dividend divisor and quotient all floats. And then I'll obtain two values from the user, divide them, and report the result. So dividend equals float input, please enter a number. Divisor equals float input, please enter another number. And then quotient equals dividend divided by divisor. And then print the result of curly braces slash curly braces is curly braces dot format dividend divisor quotient. And I'll put some comments. A 
obtain two values from the user, divide the first value by the second, display the quotient to the user. That is pretty straightforward. If I save and run the program and enter 10 and 3, we get the expected 3.3 repeating with a 5 at the end for a result. But look at what happens when I run the program and enter 0 at the second prompt. Mathematically, you can't divide by 0. The result is undefined. Different programming languages handle this differently. Python just crashes. You can see I get a red message and the error is zero division error. This is what we call a runtime error. The program is syntactically correct, meaning Python can understand how we put the symbols together and it can run the program. But when it runs, depending on the values in the variables, the program might crash or throw an exception. In this case, we tried to divide with a divisor of zero, and we got a zero division error. Let's write an if statement to prevent that. After line 12, we know what value is in divisor, and we can test it. We can write if divisor is not equal to zero, colon, and then indent the division and the print. And that way, we'll only proceed with the program if it's not going to crash. Now, I wrote an exclamation point followed by an equals sign for not equals, which you probably didn't expect. Let's go over the different relational operators so you know how to write these logical expressions that evaluate to true or false. You've already seen equals, which is two equals signs together with no space, and not equals, which is exclamation point followed by an equals sign with no space. Believe it or not, the exclamation point is used in a lot of languages to mean not. In Python, it's only used as part of not equals to mean not. And you might have guessed, we can't use a single equals sign for equals because we already use that for assignment, for giving a value to a variable. Those are very easy to mix up. So remember that when we are testing a variable, we use two equals signs. And the others are greater than, the right angle bracket, less than, the left angle bracket, greater than or equal to, the right angle bracket followed by an equal sign with no space between them, and less than or equal to, the left angle bracket followed by an equal sign with no space between them. So how do these work? Let's look at a number line. And imagine we have a variable called x. We don't need to know what x represents because we can use these tests on any numeric variables and we can even use them on strings, although what they all mean with strings might not be immediately obvious. But we can imagine x is an x-coordinate. Now x equals equals a value, let's say 0, is pretty straightforward. It's true if x was assigned 0 and it's false if it's any other number. x not equal to a value, say 0, is true if x is any number other than 0, and it's only false if x happens to equal 0. x less than 0, for example, will be true if x is any number to the left of 0 on the number line. It's false if x is 0 or any number to the right of 0. And the difference between x less than 0 and x less than or equal to zero is that this is true if x is any number to the left of zero or zero itself. Now similarly, x greater than zero will be true if x is any number to the right of zero on the number line. It's false if x is zero or any number to the left. And x greater than or equal to zero will be true if x is any number to the right of 0 or 0 itself. And of course, the number doesn't have to be 0. We can test for any numeric variable to be less than, less than or equal to, greater than or greater than or equal to any number. So we can test age greater than or equal to 18 to test for voting age, 
or we can test pressure less than 33 to find out if I need to fill my tires with air, or temperature greater than 80 to decide whether to go to the beach today. It depends on the program and what you're trying to do. Now let's take a quick look back at the operator precedence table for Python. And now you know a few more operators in the table, not just the arithmetic operators. You can see the relational operators are in here too. And you can see that they're below the arithmetic operators. So if we had an expression like current year minus birth year is greater than or equal to 18, then the subtraction would take place before the comparison. That really makes intuitive sense. If the comparison had a higher precedence, then we'd end up with current year minus true or current year minus false, which you can do in Python, but you probably don't mean to do it. Okay, so that's a start on branching structures in Python. We talked about the if statement, how it alters flow of control, how to write one, and then the relational operators, which can be used in writing the tests of an if statement. I'm going to end this video here, and I urge you to experiment with this. Try retyping the programs in this video from scratch without looking at them, and see if you can get them syntactically and semantically correct. Try changing little things, like change the kind of ice cream you're comparing and the message. Try a different calculation. In the division program, get integers from the user and see if you get the same error if you try to do integer division by zero, the two slashes, or mod by zero, the percent, and change the output message accordingly. I've also included two auto-graded exercises in the description of this video so you can practice with the video code. Once you've mastered the concepts here, you're ready to move on.